you would open in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 1. We've completed the first chapter of Mark, and we are entering the second. It's always good to remember that when we open God's Word, we are opening God's Word to us with all of its authority and power and ability to transform our lives. We bring our lives under this word. We don't sit in judgment over it. We come ready for our lives to be evaluated, comforted, helped, transformed. So let's come with that expectation in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Lord, please bless the preaching of your word. In 1980, a man named John McKenzie visited a medical facility in California and was attended by a Dr. Gerald Barnes. McKenzie complained of dry mouth and lips, sudden weight loss, dizziness, and insatiable thirst. Classic symptoms of uncontrolled diabetes. The doctor ordered tests, but sent the patient home, prescribing rest and a drug to treat the dizziness. Two days later, the patient, John McKenzie, was found dead in his Anaheim apartment after lapsing into a diabetic coma. Barnes was subsequently charged with murder. He was charged with murder because Mr. Gerald Barnes was not actually a doctor. Actually, Gerald Barnes was not even his real name. He had stolen the name and credentials of a doctor years earlier, had practiced medicine for years, but was not and had never been a real doctor. The man James Edwards saw that day in his moment of greatest need had no authority to help him and lacked the ability to save him. What Edwards needed was a real doctor. But what he got instead was a fatal dose of false assurance. What do we need? All of us have a deep and desperate need. We are all walking around, but if we're honest with ourselves, we know there is a deep need 
that comes from the inside of us and that we can also see evidence of all around our world. And who, who is able to help us in our need? How do we discern a real solution from false voices of hope? Hollywood star and actor Ben Affleck in an interview with the New York Times said this, People with compulsive behavior, and I am one, have this kind of basic discomfort all the time that they are trying to make go away. You're trying to make yourself feel better with eating or drinking or sex or gambling or shopping or whatever. But that ends up making your life worse. Then you do more of it to make that discomfort go away. Then... The real pain starts. It becomes a vicious cycle. You can't break. That's at least what happened to me. Now that is precisely what Mark wants to help us with this morning. It is precisely the need for someone who can break that cycle who can provide a real cure, a real doctor for the soul. That need that Affleck and countless others experience on a day-to-day basis, that all of us in some portion of our lives experience on a day-to-day basis, is exactly what Mark is trying to help us with in these 12 verses. He wants to introduce us to the one who has the authority and the ability to help those with a desperate need. He wants to tell us that there is one. There is one who can. And Mark wants to bring us to him in a little house in the town of Capernaum in Galilee. Let's walk through this story, introduce ourselves again to this doctor in four stages. Mercy preached. Mercy sought, mercy questioned, and mercy demonstrated. Preached, sought, questioned, and demonstrated. Let's start with mercy preached. It says in, chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 2 that when Jesus returned to Capernaum, remember he had to leave Capernaum because he was not interested in merely being a popular miracle worker and the crowds were gathering. He left Capernaum and then came back after some days and it was reported, the actual phrase there could be word got out, uh, that he was at home. And many, it says, were gathered together. No surprise. Jesus has already proven that he can cast out demons, that he can heal a leper. And so it's not surprising that the crowds would begin to gather. And many were gathered there, apparently around this home. And there was no more room, not even at the door. Mark describes crowds throughout this gospel and as a way of pointing out the kind of attractive, magnificent appeal and ability that Jesus had. So in this case, there is a, a home, probably a small home. It is so packed with people, and people are listening in at the door, trying to catch a little bit of what this man is saying, so much so that when the four men come later, they can't even get in at the door. Before we get to that event, let's just notice something, that when this crowd gathers, what is Jesus doing? He was preaching, it says in verse 2, the word to them. It is worth noticing that Mark has presented Jesus three times now as determined to preach the news of the kingdom. Described here as preaching the word. We were told in chapter 1 that Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God has come, repent, and believe in the good news. He was unwilling to continue his healing ministry in that opening day of ministry because he wanted the other towns to hear this good news. And here we have Jesus, when the crowd gathers again, preaching the word. We need to allow this, this little sentence to strike us. Here is one who can cast out demons, who can provide miraculous healings, and yet it seems his priority is preaching the word of God's mercy. Jesus is compassionate towards physical, people's physical needs, but he is passionate about their greater spiritual need, and he will bring the good news of God that can ultimately rescue their souls. 
He is preaching the word. Let there be uh, no doubt in your minds. If people ever raise the question, why is it that the Christian church is so passionate about preaching? Isn't that just sort of a, a reformation emphasis? Or maybe it's an enlightenment kind of emphasis. Why is preaching the word so important? You can take them right back here to the first two chapters of Mark and say, look, we get this idea from Jesus himself. The Christian church is passionate about the preaching of the gospel because Jesus was passionate about preaching the gospel. And not every preacher has the ability to provide the kind of supernatural healing that Jesus could do with a word, though all of us should be praying that God would heal the sick whenever we come across them and believing that he is able to do that. And yet certainly there should be this same passion in the Christian church to see the word of God's mercy proclaimed. And surely if it's a priority for Jesus, it should be a priority for us to hear the word of the kingdom, the word of the gospel, because the Savior himself is dedicated to proclaiming that word to those who will hear him. Mercy is being preached. And when we come to that word, let's remember we're coming to one who is more than just a religious entertainer. He he is more than just a skillful teacher, a a clever illustrator. We're coming to one who has supernatural power and who speaks with supernatural authority. And that is precisely why these four men came pressing in to the back of the crowd, carrying their paralyzed friend. Let's move on to that next section, which I'll caption, Mercy Sought. Mercy saw it. They came, speaking of these four men, bringing to him a paralytic. And they could not get near him because of the crowd. And we've all seen pictures, perhaps of Times Square or somewhere, where the crowd is is so thick, it, it seems impossible even to press your way through it. It is a wall of humanity surrounding the Savior. And that these men are determined. They know that in that house is the only one with the authority to rescue their friend. In that house is the only one who can speak, and this man can be healed. So they are determined. They will not let the obstacle of these people stop them. So up they go, up the outside stairs, as there would have been in those tight days, up the outside stairs of this house and over the roof, <laughs> while Jesus is teaching on the inside. Now those kinds of houses were built with slats of wood across over which was laid thatch and a layer of mud, and they begin to dig. Now, now we're supposed to feel the awkwardness of this moment. Jesus is teaching. He's instructing people in the town, and all of a sudden, dirt starts to come down out of the ceiling. I don't know whose house this was. We can only imagine the indignation. It might have been Peter's, it might have been John's, but surely they're a little bit indignant as well. Hey, I spent a lot of time working on that. Here comes dirt out of the ceiling while these men are literally pulling apart the thatch, moving aside the wood, and dirt comes crumbling down into the auditorium of Jesus' message. And the hole gets larger and larger, large enough apparently for a man on a bed to be lowered in. I don't know what that house size was, but that's a big hole. That is not a crack. That's bad when it rains. That is a large hole in this guy's roof. And suddenly, it's not just a hole, but a man is now lowered down right into the midst of Jesus' last point. Here he comes. Now, the point of this story is meant to confront us with the kind of determined and desperate faith of these men. Is it not? Listen, they're, they're, they're not concerned about anything. They're, they're not concerned with decorum. They're not even concerned with personal property. They're not, they're not concerned with any kind of dignity. They're not concerned with looking foolish, looking radical, looking outrageous. They are dead set on one thing. In that house is the man who has the authority to do something about our friend. In that house is the one who can make a difference. The one who has the ability to make a difference. In that house, there he is. And we are getting in there, and nothing is going to stop us. I think it's meant to confront us a bit with our own faith. 
Mark is not a verbose writer. Compared to the other gospel writers, Mark is very succinct. So the fact that he describes this level of detail on this story is very intentional. He wants to confront us with their desperate, undignified faith. When's the last time you dug through somebody's roof to get somewhere? He wants to confront us. Let's pause for a moment and compare our faith for Jesus to that of these men. Surely every person here has some area in your own life or the lives of your children or your friends that needs the kind of supernatural help that only Jesus can provide. Pause for a moment. Think about where that area is. Where is it in your life that there is a a need that exceeds your abilities and any ability of any person you know. It exceeds those abilities. Parents, do you have a a child that needs divine mercy because of a sickness or because of some hardness in their soul? I trust that some of you do. I know I do. Husbands and wives, do you not need some kind of divine mercy in some area of your marriage? Some area that goes beyond your ability, goes beyond your skill to heal or to fix? Perhaps some of us here are drawn to alcohol or drugs or perhaps food or media or work are your drugs of choice And like Affleck said, they enslave you in a cycle for years, trying to get rid of that subtle sense of discomfort in your soul, that subtle sense of unease, and you've looked to countless other ways to calm your soul down, and none of them have accomplished giving you that peace that you need. Listen, this happens to Christians and non-Christians alike. Every human being is is a a walking mixture of needs and self-solutions. And we need to allow our faith to be challenged by the faith of these men. They would stop at nothing from bringing their need to the Lord Jesus. So what is stopping us? What is stopping you? No crowd would stop them. No sense of their own stature. No pride or dignity. No desire to appear to be having it all together. Nothing would stop them from seeking Jesus. Nothing would stop them from going to the one person that they believed had the ability to make a difference beyond the natural. Now surely they are placed here to confront our own reluctance to seek Jesus' mercy with all of our heart and soul. And Jesus' response to their faith should encourage us still more. He responds in a way just as shocking as their seeking of him. Seeing their faith towards him to heal the man, he declares a shocking, unexpected response. When Jesus, in verse 5, saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus sees in these men a seed, something that believes him to be more than an ordinary man, believes him to be able to convey divine healing, and seeing that faith, he decides to reward it with a solution far beyond what they were even asking. He sees beyond this man's physical limitations to his spiritual need, and he diagnoses a cure. Your sins, my son, are forgiven. Here comes the physician of the soul, seeing past his external need, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, surely we can hear gasps in the room, can we not? They had come to expect Jesus to heal sick people, and surely they were leaning in, crowding at the door, wondering if the lame man would walk. What they were not expecting is for a man to pronounce divine forgiveness. They were not expecting that. That was a cure far beyond what they were hoping. And surely that's a cure beyond what we would have been hoping. 
But isn't this good news for us? When we consider that list of our desperate needs, surely that list that you just came up with included the hard-heartedness of soul that either you have or someone you love has. Surely it includes that in your heart. And here is Jesus saying, oh, I see your physical needs. And I am able to heal those as well, but I see past them to an even greater need. I see past them to the depth of your soul, to the depth of your condemnation from God. I see past them to the need that you have that you have always had. And I declare to you, my son, your sins are forgiven. Here is God the Son proclaiming a divine pronouncement over this sinner. Your sins are forgiven. You are set free. From your guilt. Gasps in the room. A pronouncement was just made on earth that no man may presume. Mercy has been sought, and mercy deeper than the seeking has responded. But not all in the room are glad to hear Jesus' pronouncement. For the paralyzed man. So we move on to mercy questioned. Mercy questioned. Verse 6. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now we might be surprised at their outrage because in our culture we tend to assume that people have the right to be forgiven. That not feeling forgiven is a unnecessary problem that many people experience and if they would only learn to forgive themselves they could experience the forgiveness that they have a right to have. And so we are a bit irritated with the scribes in a way that I think we should not be. Because the scribes were half right. Our culture is actually more wrong than the scribes. Here's why. The scribes were assuming that only God could forgive sins. They were at least right about that. Our culture assumes that people can forgive sins. They would have had no problem with Jesus pronouncing this and assuming that Jesus was also a mere man because our culture assumes you don't even need another person to forgive your sins. You just need to forgive yourself. The scribes are actually better off than many people in our culture and maybe even ourselves because of the assumption that guilt is an archaic concept that should quickly be alleviated by positive energy and self-affirmation. The scribes are more right than almost every self-help book you've ever seen. It is true that only God can forgive sins. They are not wrong about that. Their offense is based on a right understanding from the pages of Scripture that no sinner can forgive another sinner of their sin against God because every sinner belongs to God and God has the right of the worship of every created human being and our failure to love him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength is an offense worthy of condemnation and so only God who made us has the right to forgive us and so they were right about that. And we are not going to appreciate the phrase, my son, your sins are forgiven, if we assume that sin can easily passed over, be passed over by optimism. The Bible disagrees with our positive assessment. Imagine, if you would, a murderer being told on his way to execution that it will all turn out all right. That's what our culture says. It says it will all turn out all right. But the Bible disagrees with us. The Bible says, no, it will not. Every human being, because they are a sinner, is on their way to a divine execution. And no, it will not turn out all right. And no human voice of assurance means anything in that moment. In one sense, the scribes are right. God and God alone can forgive sins. And that is exactly the point Jesus wants to make. 
Jesus perceives their internal accusation in verse 8. And he begins what we might describe as a courtroom drama. You've all seen those, I'm sure, in, in television and <laughs> movies. A, a courtroom drama where a witness is brought to the stand and they are cross-examined. Well, imagine Jesus is now acting in his own defense and he's going to cross-examine his own accuser. That's what's going on here. We're not as familiar with this process other than in the courtroom. We don't tend to speak this way, asking questions to answer a question. But Jesus uses it all the time. And so if we think of a courtroom drama, we'll be a little closer to what's going on here. Jesus asks them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. So so let me try to paraphrase what's going on here so we can feel the force of what is happening. Jesus is essentially saying this, why don't you think I can forgive sins? Is it because you do not think I am God? And the witness answers, yes, we don't. We don't think you are God if they were given an answer. So Jesus asks another question. Let me ask you again, do you think it's easier to pronounce forgiveness or to heal this man? Now, as Christians, we know the ultimately right theological answer. It's much harder to pronounce forgiveness than to heal a single disease. But that's not what Jesus is doing. He's dealing with them on their own terms. And in their own terms, it is much harder to demonstrate a healing than to speak useless words of forgiveness. So Jesus is saying, do you think it's harder to heal than to forgive? And if we can imagine a reply, it might be something like this. Well, anyone could claim they have the right to forgive sins. That's like claiming to pull an invisible rabbit out of an invisible hat. How do we know if it's true, Jesus? So yeah, I think it's harder, they would say, to heal a man. Boy, if you could do that, that would really be something. Just saying that his sins are forgiven. How do we know if you're right or not? How do we know if you have the authority to say that and it be true? You might be a fraud. After all, you might be sending this man home with false assurance, still on his way to execution. Well, Jesus says, I'll prove it to you. Since you think that healing this man is harder because it will be visible in your eyes. That's what you said, right? You said it would be harder, right? Because no one could fake that. Yes, that's what we said. I'll do that in order to prove before your very eyes that God's power and authority are at work in the man seated before you. Jesus has backed them into a rhetorical trap. He's not saying that healing is harder than forgiveness, so he's dealing with them on their own terms. He's saying, if I can do something that you can't deny requires divine power, then you won't be able to deny that the divine power needed to forgive sins is also resident in me. You'll have to admit, won't you, that God's authority is indeed present in me. In a few short questions, Jesus has placed everything on the line. He has taken the scribes' own objection and he will use it against them. He will use their own eyes to defeat their objection. Now, what came into your mind When Jesus said he forgave the man's sins. What comes into your mind when you think about forgiveness? Why is this proof crucial? Listen, optimism without authority isn't real help for a real need. What if a man dying of diabetes hears a doctor tell him to rest and take some dizziness pills and it'll all be better? Don't be so quick to assume forgiveness that you miss the need for someone to prove they have the right to forgive. If Jesus does not have the authority to forgive sins, he's no better off than the wishful forgiveness that cuts through the church today. Wishful forgiveness doesn't offer any real assurance to anybody with real sins. And if you've been living on a diet of wishful forgiveness you know when you really sin, it doesn't comfort you at all. Wishful forgiveness doesn't comfort the mother who know that she knows that she's given into anger against her children or her husband again. It doesn't comfort the drunk driver sitting in his prison cell because he ran over a pedestrian. 
Wishful forgiveness doesn't help the man enslaved to pornography or the couple who aborted their child to cover their own guilt. Wishful forgiveness is useless in moments like that. Wishful forgiveness is not nice, it's not kind, it doesn't cover the real need. Wishful forgiveness is a false dose of assurance that sends someone home to continue their battle and cycle of guilt and sin. We must feel the drama of this moment if we are to feel the point Jesus is making for the man and for the scribes and for you. Does he have the authority to forgive sins? Commentator Edmund Hebert puts it this way, to forgive sin was God's acknowledged prerogative in heaven. Jesus' claim to the right to exercise that authority implied that he possessed it as God's representative on earth. The hostility of the scribes stemmed from their refusal to accept his claim. Jesus well knew that the credibility of his whole ministry and mission rested on the outcome of his command to the man. Conscious of his authorization, he spoke with calm, sublime certainty. Listen, if you ever need a point to make to someone battling the legitimacy and and reality of Jesus, you can point to countless moments like this. Listen, if Jesus had failed, would not the crowd have dispersed? If Jesus had failed, wouldn't he be the laughingstock of every religious leader rather than a threat to them? If Jesus had failed, why would he be worth listening to at all? He put everything on the line. Guilty or not of blasphemy was on the line. He claims to be God, but can he back it up? He claims to pronounce God's forgiveness, but can he back it up? He claims to have the authority to say to you, your sins are forgiven, but does it matter at all in the end? Is he that false doctor sending you home with false assurance in the midst of your sins? Is he that doctor who says it will all turn out all right in the end? Or is he the one who can actually say your sins are forgiven? So having set up the scribes in a way that their own eyes will be witnesses against them, he turns to speak again to the paralyzed man. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Section four, mercy demonstrated. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all. Now the crowd parts to watch the lame man walk home. They were all amazed. You can feel the end of the courtroom drama, right? The movie ends, the credits roll, the crowd leaps to its feet, shouting, we never saw anything like this. Glory to God in the highest. We never saw anything like this. And they were more right than they knew. In all likelihood, this crowd is impressed with the miracle and still blinded to the true implications of what that miracle communicates. But what they were actually seeing was God in the flesh doing what God can do. What they were actually seeing is the answer to the original question. God alone can forgive sins. Yes, and God is present in the house in Capernaum. God is present forgiving sins and raising the lame man. God is present in Galilee on earth proclaiming with God's own authority what only God can speak and do. Rise, he says. Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. The God who made the man remade the man. The God who made this man and saw him in his sin forgive 
forgives the man and restores him. The God who has every right to heal and to forgive has spoken in a little house in Capernaum. Rise, he says, your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and go home. And they all glorified God. We've never seen anything like this. Indeed, they were right. They were seeing God in Jesus Christ do what only God can do. Because Jesus is God himself, he offers the mercy of God himself. That's Mark's point. Because Jesus is God himself, he offers the mercy of God himself. This passage is about the authority to forgive, the authority to provide divine mercy. And it presents the shocking truth in story form that that authority is present in the man, Jesus Christ. Though Jesus refuses to be the political Messiah they crave, he desires to reveal himself as a divine Messiah that they need. He says the Son of Man has authority, a reference to the prophet Daniel, where this divine figure comes down to do what only God can do. And Jesus calls himself that figure because he's about to reveal his divine power in this little house and to this little man. God himself has come to earth and offers forgiveness to those who come to him with faith. And he proves the authority to do that by healing this man who could not heal himself. Now there is a fraud savior in our culture and often in our own hearts. It urges you to forgive yourself so that others can forgive you. It urges you to live the good life because God wants you to be happy. It urges you that it will all turn out all right in the end, that only the worst of the worst will be condemned by God and everyone else will make it smiling into God's kingdom. Western spirituality has been described as therapeutic, moralistic deism. It says we want you to feel good, we want you to do the right thing, and remember there's a God out there, and that is enough to get you to heaven. But this passage says, no, the only one with the authority to get you to heaven and out of the ravages of this world is the man, Christ Jesus. There is only one person who can fit the need of your soul. Only one. There is only one person who can forgive you of your anger, your sin, your lust, your craving, your selfishness, your idolatry, and mine. There is only one person who can forgive the proud man standing before you and the selfish people that we all are. There is only one. There is only one who can rescue us out of the ravages of this broken world, whether he heals us now or in the future. There is only one who has the authority. And all other voices are false impossible declaring to go home, take a few pills for the dizziness, and it will all be all right. But there is a real physician, and he can heal the soul. He can raise the sick. He can raise the dead. He can proclaim forgiveness. And God himself stamps his authority on that man and says, you can believe him because he is my son. On his behalf. Let me urge you this morning. Maybe you've been a Christian 40 years. Maybe 50. Maybe two. Maybe you're not a Christian. This man, who is God, invites you to come to him. He invites you. He invites you to come with your need. What is your need? Be honest with yourself. He already knows what it is. You can't hide from the Lord who sees everything. He knows your need. Where is your need? You have a a deep need. Maybe it's a practical need like this man. Maybe you need healing. Certainly, there are some who need healing. And certainly, all of us need spiritual healing. What is your need? Would you hold back from the one who has the authority to diagnose and cure you? To pronounce forgiveness. He has declared that whoever comes to him, he will not cast 
out. His mercy is deeper than we ever dare to ask. And his authority pronounces forgiveness that he is able to guarantee. In this same authority, Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay for the forgiveness he pronounced over this man. In this authority, he declared, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. In this authority, he said, it is finished. In this authority, he declared, Father, I commend to you my spirit. And in this authority, he said, the Son of Man goes to serve as a ransom for many, and in three days, he will rise. In this authority, he declares to every person within sound of this voice, what is your need? Bring it to the one who is able to deal with every problem you have and to heal you. So what lingering guilt is in your conscience? Here is the voice of God's own son saying, I give my life as a ransom for many. Are you weak and weary? Well, there will come a day in the future when the Son of God will say to you, stand up and rise and go home. If you find yourself bent over or paralyzed by guilt, then declare, declare that you hear his voice speaking over you that your sins are forgiven and he promises you a new body and a new life with him. Perhaps you're still holding back from him. Perhaps you're in the crowd, glad to see what Jesus is doing, but still trying, trying to stay out of eye contact with him. You ever tried to do that during a message? Try to avoid eye contact, whether it's with the preacher or (laughs) really with the Lord Jesus? Just kind of ducking and weaving and bobbing. Okay, I have a need, but let me figure it out first. Listen, make eye contact with the one who says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Rise, take up your mat, and go home. Bring all your needs to the one who is God, who can offer mercy as God, and who is far greater than the greatest needs you have. Charles Spurgeon says this to close. Humbling as is the statement, yet the fact is certain that we are all more or less suffering under the disease of sin. What a comfort to know that we have a great physician who is both able and willing to heal us. Let us think of him. Whatever our spiritual malady may be, we should apply at once to this divine physician There is no brokenness of heart which Jesus cannot bind up. His blood cleanseth all from sin, from all sin. We have but to think of the myriads who have been delivered from all sorts of disease through the power and virtue of his touch, and we shall joyfully put ourselves in his hands. We trust him, and sin dies. We love him, and grace lives. We wait for him, and grace is strengthened. We see him as he is, and grace is perfected forever. Come to the one who has the authority to pronounce the cure. Your sins are forgiven. Rise and come home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for hearts that have been wandering this morning, weary and perhaps feeling paralyzed physically or spiritually, and in need of your word of rescue. Lord, I pray that they would hear your voice respoken through this very verse. Lord, that as they bring their sins to you, you proclaim over them, those sins are forgiven. Lord, I pray it would be a very real sense that they sense you present with them right now through your spirit, reassuring them, granting to them that assurance of forgiveness. Lord, please do that this morning. Lord, there are 
all of us in this room that have areas where we need, we need you. And so, Lord, we, we press in, Lord. We dig through. We come any way we can, Lord. We come to you. We come in our need, on the mat of our paralysis, desperate for you to speak. Lord Jesus, speak your word of grace and forgiveness and healing into the heart of everyone drawing near to you right now. In Jesus' name.